G'day everyone, and welcome back to the 39 Steps. When we last left, Richard Hane was back in London. He had gone out on the town and run into some old friends. Was chased by the police and wound up at Sir Walter's house, where he met an imposter. Someone impersonating an admiral. What will Richard Hanny find behind the back door? So, let's continue the story of the 39 steps with this next chapter. Conveniently called the 39 steps. The 39 steps. Sunday... 14th June 1914, Queen Anne's Gate, London. And I feel reassured. Sir Walter! Five surprised faces looked up f from a round table. There was Sir Walter and Drew the War Minister, whom I knew from his photographs. There was a slim elderly man, who was probably Whitaker, the Admiralty official. And there was General Winstanley, conspicuous from the long scar on his forehead. Lastly, there was a short, stout man with an iron grey moustache and bushy eyebrows. This must have been Leir. This is Mr. Hannay, of whom I have spoken to you. I'm afraid, Hannay, this visit is ill-timed. That remains to be seen, sir. But I think it may be in the nick of time. For God's sake, gentlemen, tell me who went out a minute ago. Sir Walter's face reddened with anger. Lord Alloa. It was not. <laughs> it was his living image, but it was not Lord Alloa. It was someone who recognized me, someone I have seen in the last month. He had scarcely left the doorstep when I rang up Lord Alloa's house and was told he had come in half an hour before and had gone to bed. Uh, uh, who? Uh, the Black Stone. Nonsense. I sat down in the chair so recently vacated and looked around at five badly scared gentlemen. So Walter got up and left the room while well, we looked blankly at the table. He came back in ten minutes with a long face. I have spoken to Aloha. Had him out of bed very grumpy. He went straight home after Malross's dinner. But it's madness. Do you mean to tell me that that man came here and sat beside me for the best part of half an hour and that I didn't detect the imposture? Aloha must be out of his mind. I was getting back my coolness. But don't you see the cleverness of it? You were too interested in other things to have any eyes. You took Lord Aloha for granted. If it had been anybody else, you might have looked more closely, but it was natural for him to be here, and that put you all to sleep. Where bent his wise bow on the assembly? The young man is right. His psychology is good. Our enemies have not been foolish. I will tell you a tale. It happened many years ago in Senegal. What happened to Voyer? I love these scenes. These are so cool. Where's Clochet? Gillette, the best a man can get. Many years ago, the General Lair was quartered in a remote station in Senegal. Mm. To pass the time, he fished for big barbel in the river. I love this. This is re so really well done. I'll be back soon, girl. Be good horsey.
One morning, his horse was one unaccountably restless. Lawyer kept soothing her with his voice, his mind intent on fishing. I'll be back soon, girl. Just be a good horsey. Be a good horsey. Don't mind that uh, tiger. A couple of hours passed. Do 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 do. General Lawyer returns. Oh, his poor horse has been killed. Very sad. Oh no. Lawyer stood face to face with an old man-eater. What happened? I was enough of a hunter to know a true yarn when I heard it. I stuffed my fishing rod into his jaws, and I had a pistol. Also, my servants came presently with rifles. But he left his mark on me. He held up a hand which lacked three fingers. Consider. The mayor had been dead more than an hour, and the brute had been patiently watching me ever since. I never saw the kill, for I was accustomed to the mayor's fretting, and I never marked her absence, for my consciousness of her was only of something uh, tawny, and the lion filled that part. If I could blunder thus, gentlemen, in a land where men's senses are keen, why should we busy, preoccupied urban folk not err also? Yes, Sir Walter nodded. No one was ready to can you say him? Well, I suppose there is nothing for it but to change the plans. Whittaker was looking very glum. Did you tell Lord Alloa what has happened? No? Well, I can't speak with absolute assurance, but I'm nearly certain we can't make any serious change, unless we alter the geography of England. He paused and looked around. God! We have not a rag of a clue. Besides, there is the post. By this time, the news will be on its way. No. You do not understand the habits of the spy. He receives personally his reward, and he delivers personally his intelligence. We in France know something of the breed. Now, oh, there is still a chance, mes amis. These men must cross the sea. And there are ships to be searched and ports to be watched. Believe me, the need is desperate for both France and Britain. I had a sudden inspiration. Where is Scudder's book? Quick, man. I remember something in it. Oh, what is the okay? enemy? Ah, oh, wrong way, Bish. Come on, concentrate. Ha. 39 steps. 39 steps. I counted them. High tide, 10.17 p.m. What yeah, relevance is all... The Admiralty man was looking at me as if he thought I had gone quite mad. Don't you see? Know. It's a clue. Scudder knew where these fellows led. He knew where they were going to leave the country, though he kept the name to himself. Tomorrow was the day... And it was some place where high tide was at 10.17. But they may have gone tonight. Not they. They have their own snug secret way and they won't be hurried. I know Germans and they are mad about working to a plan. Where the devil can I get a book of tide tables? Whitaker brightened up. It's a chance. Let's go over to the Admiralty. We got into t into two of the waiting motor cars. 
So Whitaker, uh, Sir Walter went off to Scotland Yard to mo mobilise McGilvray. The Admiral. See, that's interesting. That's one building I didn't see when I was in London. It's a bit silly of me. A resident clerk was unearthed who presently fetched from the library the Admiralty Tide Tables. Ooh, Tide Tables. Mmm, Tide Tables. I sat at the desk and the others stood around. For somehow or other, I had got charge of this expedition. But it was no good. So far as I could see, 1017 might cover 50 places. We had to find some way of narrowing the possibilities. There must be some way of reading this riddle. Ooh, the riddle. No time. Time is running out. 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 Time would appear to be running out. Okay. The steps. What did Scudder mean by steps? If it were dock steps, why mention the number? It must be some place with several staircases and one marked out from the other by having 39 steps. Non-elementary. This is all guesswork. I am no kind of Sherlock Holmes. But I do have a feeling about it. High tide. Why was high tide so important? It must be some little harbour, or no harbour at all. There were no sets of staircase on any harbour that I had ever seen. The place must be a bit of open coast. Which coast? I must put myself in the enemy's shoes. I wouldn't leave from the Channel or the West Coast. Scotland is too far, and I should... I should try for Ostend or Antwerp or Rotterdam. I should sail from somewhere on the east coast between Kroma and Dover. Germany. He's a man in a hurry. He wants a speedy and secret passage. They wouldn't travel by a big boat from a regular harbour. There's no regular steamer sailing at that hour. Hmm. I set out all of my conclusions on a bit of admiralty paper. Okay, fairly certain. Place where there are several sets of stairs. One that matters, distinguished by having 39 steps. Full tide at 10.17. Leaving shore only possible at full tide. Steps, not dock steps, so probably not a harbour. No regular night steamer at 10.17. Means of transport must be tramp, unlikely, yacht or fishing boat. Guest. Place not a harbour but open coast. Small boat, trawler, yacht or launch. Some place on east coast between Cromer and Dover. So Walter had joined us, and presently McGilvray arrived. He had sent out instructions to watch the ports and railway stations for the three men whom I had described to Sir Walter. Not that he or anybody else thought that that would do much good. Here's the most I can make of it. We have got to find a place where there are several staircases down to the beach, one of which has 39 steps. I think it's a piece of open coast with biggish cliffs somewhere between the Wash and the Channel. Also, it's a place where full tide is at 10.17 tomorrow night. Go. Then an idea struck me. Is there no inspector of coast guards or some fellow like that that knows the East Coast? Why, yes, there is. He lives in Clapham. Let me get him now.
<laughs> Good old Clapham Junction. He went off in a car to fetch him. I lit a pipe and went over the whole thing again till my brain grew weary. At one in the morning, the Coast Guard man arrived. He was a fine old fellow, with the look of a naval officer, and was desperately respectful to the company. This is the chap. Good evening, gentlemen. We want you to tell us the places you know on the East Coast, where there are cliffs, and where several sets of steps run down to the beach. What kind of steps do you mean, sir? There are plenty of places with roads cut down through the cliffs, and most roads have a step or two in them. Or do you mean regular staircases, all steps, so to speak? Whitaker looked towards me. We mean regular staircases. He reflected a minute or two. I don't know that I can think of any. Wait a second. There's a place in Norfolk, Browsham, beside a golf course, where there are a couple of staircases to let the gentlemen get a lost ball. That's not it. Then there are plenty of marine parades, if that's what you mean. Every seaside resort has them. I shook my head. He's got to be more retired than that. Well, gentlemen, I can't think of anywhere else. Of course, there's the rough. What's that? The big chalk headland in Kent, close to Bradgate. It's got a lot of villas on the top. And some of the houses have staircases down to a private beach. It's a very high-toned sort of place. And the residents there like to keep by themselves. Aha. We're on the scent at last. How can I find out what is the tide at the rough? I can tell you that, sir. I once was lit a house there in this very month, and I used to go out at night to the deep sea fishing. The tide's ten minutes before Bradgate. I closed the book and looked around the company. If one of those staircases has 39 steps, we have solved the mystery, gentlemen. I want the loan of your car, Sir Walter, and a map of the roads. Of course. If Mr. McGillivray will spare me ten minutes, yes. I think we can prepare something for tomorrow. Good, good, yeah, good. Yeah. I, for one, am content to leave the matter in Mr. Hannay's hands. It was ridiculous of me to take charge of the business like this, but they didn't seem to mind, and after all, I had been in the show from the start. Besides, I was used to rough jobs, and these eminent gentlemen were too clever not to see it. Half past three that morning, I was tearing past the moonlit hedgerows of Kent, with McGilvray's best man, Scaife, on the seat beside me. Well... I think we shall probably continue. Master of Disguise. Hanny is confident he has the right place, but doubts begin to service when he sees the target. Let's dive into the Kent countryside. Master of Disguise. Monday, 15th of June, 1914. Bradgate, Kent. Oh, a lovely little golf course. <laughs> Very pretty. Oh, I like it. Boats out in the channel. The Griffin Hotel. Pink and blue morning found me at Bradgate, looking from the Griffin Hotel 
over a smooth sea. The light ship on the cook oh, from the cock sand. Okay. The light ship on the cock sand seemed the size of a bellboy. A couple of miles farther south, and much nearer the shore, a small destroyer was anchored. Mm. Scaife had been in the navy and knew the boat. He told me her name and her commanders. So I sent off a wire to Sir Walter. Done there. After breakfast, Scaife got from a house agent a key for the gates of the staircases on the roof. I walked with him along the sands and sat down in a nook of the cliffs while he investigated the half dozen of them. I didn't want to be seen, but the place at this hour was quite deserted, and all the time I was on the beach, I saw nothing but the seagulls. It took him more than an hour to do the job. Oh, uh, everything depended on my guess proving right. He read aloud the number of steps in the different stairs. 34, 35, 42, 47, and 21, where the cliffs get lower. Oh, and 39. Scaife, we have them. Oh, yes, and 39. We hurried back to the town and sent a wire to McGilvery. I wanted half a dozen men, and I directed them to divide themselves among different specified hotels. Then Scaife sent out to prospect the house at the head of the 39 steps. He came back with news that both puzzled and reassured me. Mm. Neighbours. Next door there was a new house building which would give, you, give good cover for observation and the villa on the other side was to let and its garden was rough and shrubbery. The house. The house was called Trafalgar Lodge and belonged to an old gentleman called Appleton, a retired stockbroker, the house agent said. Only three servants were kept, a cook, a parlour maid and a housemaid. The cook was not the gossiping kind and it pretty soon shut the door in his face. But Scaife said he was positive she knew nothing. The occupants... They were just the sort that you would find in a respectable middle-class household. Mr. Appleton was there a good deal in the summertime, and was in residence now. Had been for the better part of a week. Scaife could pick up very little information about him, except that he was a decent old fellow who paid his bills regularly and was always good for a fiver for a local charity. Mm. I borrowed Scaife's telescope and before lunch went for a walk along the rough. I kept well behind the rows of villas and found a good observation point on the edge of the golf course. I observed someone leave the, ha leave the house and saunter along the cliff. I saw it was an old man wearing a white flannel trouser and blue serge jacket and a straw hat. He carried field glasses and a newspaper. He sat down on one of the iron seats and began to read. 
Sometimes he would lay down the paper and turn his glasses on the sea. He looked for a long time at the destroyer. I watched the old elderly man for half an hour till he got up and went back to the house for his luncheon. When I returned to the hotel for mine. This decent, commonplace dwelling was not what I had expected. The man might be the bold archaeologist of that horrible moorland farm, or he might not. He was exactly the kind of satisfied old bird you will find in every suburb and every holiday place. If you wanted a type of the perfectly harmless person, you would, be, you would probably pitch on that. After lunch I perked up, for I saw the thing I had hoped for and had dreaded to miss. Her name was the Ariane Ariad Aradine. The scape said she was a fast boat for her build and that she was pretty heavily engineered. Scaife and I went down to the harbour and hired a boatman for, the hour for an afternoon's fishing. About four o'clock I made the boatman row us around the yacht, which lay like a delicate white bird, ready in a moment to flee. One of the men was polishing the brasswork. I spoke to him and got an answer in, a, in the soft dialect of Essex. Another hand came along past me... <laughs> The time of day in an unmistakable English tongue. Our boatman had an argument with one of them about the weather, and for a few minutes we lay on our oars close to the starboard bow. Then the men suddenly disregarded us and bent their heads to their work as an officer came on deck. He was a pleasant, clean-looking young fellow, and he put a question to us about our fishing in very good English. But there could be no doubt about him. His close cropped head and the cut of his collar and tie never came out of England. I know the Germans. In the hotel I met the commander of the destroyer, whom Scave introduced me and with whom I had a few words. And I thought I would put in an hour or two watching Trafalgar Lodge. Mm. The thing that worried me was that was the reflection that my enemies knew that I had got my knowledge from Scudder, and it was Scudder who had given me the clue to this place. If they knew that Scudder had this clue, would they not be certain to change their plans? I had talked confidently last night about Germans always sticking to a scheme, but if they had any suspicions that I was on their track, they would be fools not to cover it. Tennis. They played with tremendous zest, like two city gents who wanted hard exercise to open their paws. They shouted and laughed and stopped for drinks, when a maid brought out two tankards on a salver. Imposters. You couldn't conceive a more innocent spectacle. I rubbed my eyes and asked myself if I was not the most immortal fool on earth. Mystery and darkness had hung about the men who hunted me over the Scotch moor in an aeroplane and a motor car, and notably about that infernal antiquarian. It was easy enough to connect these folks with the knife that pinned Scudder to the floor and with fell designs on the world's peace. But here were two guileless citizens, aching their innocuous exercise, and soon about to go indoors for a humdrum, di humdrum, humdrum dinner where they would talk of market prices and the last cricket scores. 
Mm. I've been making a net to catch vultures and falcons, and lo and behold, two plump thrushes had blundered into it. Presently, a third figure arrived, a young man on a bicycle. He was welcomed righteously by the players. Or riotously by the players. You all right there, Percy? Yes, you're looking a little hot under the collar. I got into a proper lather. This will bring down my weight and my handicap, Bob. I'll take you on tomorrow and give you a stroke a hole. <laughs> <laughs> They all went to the house and left me feeling a precious idiot. I would rather have walked into a den of anarchists, each with his browning handy, or faced a charging lion with a pop gun, than enter the happy home of three cheerful Englishmen and tell them that their game was up. But then I remembered Peter Pina. He was the best scout I ever knew, and before he had turned respectable, he had been pretty often on the wind side of the law. Peter once discussed with me the question of disguises, and he had a theory which, stuck, which struck me at the time. He said, barring absolute certainties like fingerprints, mere physical traits were very little use for identification in the fugitive if the fugitive really knew his business. The only thing that mattered was what Peter called atmosphere. Those chaps didn't need to act. They just turned a handle and passed into another life, which came as naturally to them as the first. Peter used to say that it was the big secret of all the famous criminals. This recollection gave me the first real comfort I had had that day. Peter had been wise, a wise old bird, and these fellows I was after were about the pick of the Avery. It was getting on for eight o'clock, and I went back and saw Scaife to give him his instructions. I arranged with him to, uh, I arranged with him how to place his men, and then I went for a walk. For I didn't feel up to dinner. It took all my resolution to stroll towards Trafalgar Lodge. On the way, I got a piece of solid comfort from the sight of a greyhound that was swinging along at the nursemaid's heels. He reminded me of a dog I used to have in Rhodesia. New event, High Tides. Alrighty, folks. Well, we are up to the last chapter of the 39 steps. We're going to plunge into this and see where we end at High Tide. High Tides. Monday, 15th of June, 1914, Bradsgate, Kent. A uh, beautiful house with a union, Jack. I arrived once again at Trafalgar Lodge. Scaves men would be posted by now, and there, but there was no sign of a soul. Is, uh, Mr. Appleton at home? Yes, sir. Please, come in. My plan had been, w been to walk straight into the dining room and by a sudden appearance wake in the men the start of recognition which would confirm my theory. But when I found myself in that neat hall, the place mastered me. Who may I say is calling? Richard Hanning. 
If you could weigh in the smoking room, I'll let Mr. Appleton know you're here. Realizing my, s my mistake, I pulled myself together and ran after the maid. But I was too late. Mr. Halle? Do you wish to see me? I think we have met before. And I guess you know my business. The light in the room was dim, but so far... As I could see their faces, they played the part of mystification very well. Maybe. Maybe. I haven't a very good memory, but I'm afraid you must tell me your errand, sir, for I really don't know it. Well, then, I have come to tell you that the game's up. All the time I seemed to myself to be talking pure foolishness. I have a warrant. The arrest of you three gentlemen. <laughs> arrest? Arrest? Good God, what for? He looked really shocked. For the murder of Franklin Scudder in London on the 23rd day of last month. I never heard the name before. And that was the Portland Place murder. I read about it. Good heavens. You must be mad, sir. Where do you come from? Scotland Yard. Though I hadn't a s an ounce of confidence in me, I forced myself to play the game. Don't get flustered, Uncle. It's all a ridiculous mistake. But these things happen sometimes, and we can easily set it right. It won't be hard to prove our innocence. I can show you that I was out the country on the 23rd of May, and Bob was in a nursing home. Mm. You were in London, but you can explain what you were doing. Right, Percy. Of course, that's easy enough, the 23rd. That was the day after Agatha's wedding. Let me see, what was I doing? Came up in the morning from Woking and lunched at the club with Charlie Simons. Then, oh yes, I dined with the fishmongers. I remember for the punch didn't agree with me and I was seedy next morning. Hang it all. There's the cigar box I brought back from the dinner. <laughs> After that, for a minute, there was utter silence. The old man was staring at his plate and fumbling with a nut, the very model of innocent bewilderment. I think, sir, you will see you are mistaken. We want to assist the law, like all Englishmen, and we don't want Scotland Yard to be making fools of themselves. That's so, Uncle? Certainly, Bob. The old fellow seemed to be recovering his voice. Certainly. We'll do anything in our power to assist the authorities, but this is a bit too much. I can't get over it. <laughs> How Nelly will chuckle. She always said you would die of boredom because nothing ever happened to you. <laughs> now, you've got it thick and strong. <laughs> it couldn't be acting. It was too confoundingly gen uh, confoundly genuine. By Joe, yes. Just think of it. What a story to tell at the club. Really, Mr. Hanny. I suppose I should be angry to show my innocence, but it's too funny. Uh, I almost forgive you the fright you gave me. You looked so glum. I thought I might have been walking in my sleep and killing people. To cover my confusion, I got up, walked to the door and switched on the electric light. The sudden glare made them blink, and I stood scanning the three faces. I made nothing of it. One was old and bold, one was stout, one was dark and thin. They seemed exactly what they professed to be. 
and I could not have sworn to one of them. I could see nothing to connect them with the Moorland Desperados. Mm. Well, are you reassured by your scrutiny, sir? I couldn't find a word. I hope you'll find it consistent with your duty to drop this ridiculous business. I make no complaint, but you see how annoying it must be to respectable people. I shook my head. Oh, Lord. This is a bit too thick. Do you propose to march us off to the police mm. station? That might be the best way out of it, but I suppose you won't be content with the local branch. I have the right to ask to see your warrant. But I don't wish to cast any aspersions upon you. You're only doing your duty. But you'll admit, it's horribly awkward. What do you propose to do? For a moment, I was very near damning myself for a fool and asking their pardon. Meantime, I vote we have a game of bridge. It'll give Mr. Hanny time to think over things. Well, you know we've been wanting a fourth player. Do you play, sir? I accept it as if it had been an ordinary invitation at the club. Yes. Yes, I play. I felt mesmerized by the whole place, by the air of obvious innocence, not innocence merely, but frank, honest bewilderment and concern in three faces. We went into the smoking room where a card table was set out and I was offered things to smoke and drink. The three were talking easily, just the kind of slang slangy talk you will hear in any golf clubhouse. I must have cut a rum figure sitting there knitting my brows with my eyes wandering. My partner was the young dark one. I play a fair hand at bridge but I must have been ranked bad that night. They saw that they had got me puzzled and that put them more than ever at their ease. I kept looking at their faces, but they conveyed nothing to me. It was not that they looked different, they were different. I clung desperately to the words of Peter Pinar. Then it happened. It was the movement I remember. When I had stood before him in the Moorland farm with the pistols of his servants behind me. Some shadow lifted from my brain and I was looking at the three men with full and absolute recognition. The Black Stone. Bob. The dark lean man, he was the murderer. Now I saw cruelty and ruthlessness, where before I had only seen good humour. His knife had skewered Scudder to the floor, and his kind had put the bullet in Carolides. Percy. The plump man's features seemed to dislim and form again as I looked at them. He had no face, only a hundred masks that he could assume when he pleased. That chap must have been a superb actor. Perhaps he had been Lord Aloha of the night before. Perhaps not. It didn't matter. I wondered if he was the fellow that had first tracked Scudder and left his card on him. Scudder had said he lisped, and I could imagine how the adoption of a lisp might have tear. Appleton. He was the pick of the lot. A sheer brain. Icy, cool, calculating, as ruthless as a steam hammer, 
Now that my eyes were open, I wondered where I'd seen the benevolence. His jaw was like chilled steel, and his eyes had the inhuman luminosity of a bird's. I went on playing, and every second a greater hate welled up in my heart. <sighs> Bob, look at the time. You better think about catching your train. Bob's got to go to town tonight. The voice rang now as false as hell. I looked at the clock, and it was nearly half past ten. I'm afraid he must put off his journey. Oh, damn. I thought you'd drop that rot. I've simply got to go. You can have my address, and I'll give you any security you like. No, you must stay. I'll go bail for my nephew. That ought to content you, Mr. Hannay. As I glanced at him, his eyelids fell in. That hawk-like hood which fear had stamped on my memory. A pair of strong arms gripped me around the waist, covering the pockets in which a man might be expected to carry a pistol. Get your hands off me! Nilfa! Das Buch! Das Buch! I grappled the old chap, and the room seemed to fill with figures. I saw the plump one collared, but my eyes were all for the out of doors where friends sped over the road towards the railed entrance to the beach stairs. One man followed him, but he had no chance. I stood staring with my hands on the old boy's throat for such time as a man might take to descend those steps to the sea. Suddenly my prisoner broke from me and flung himself on the wall. The stairway had been completely destroyed. He is safe. You cannot follow in time. He's gone. He has triumphed. Der Schwarze Stein is in the Siegeskrone. There was more than there was more in those eyes than any common triumph. They had been hooded like a bird of prey, and now they flamed with the hawk's pride. This man was more than a spy. In his foul way, he had been a patriot. As the hands clinked on his wrists, I said my last word to him. I hope Franz will bear his triumph well. I ought to tell you that the Ariadne for the last hour has been in our hands. The End Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of the 39 steps. I want to thank you all for joining us. If you enjoyed this series, please remember to leave a like, thumbs up, all that good stuff. If you'd like to see m something new, um, please subscribe and hit the uh, notification icon for there will be subsistence, seven days to die, and potentially something new from the developers of this game. And a big thanks to all the people in the credits who did an amazing job with the voice acting and the artists and developers. So it was a stunningly beautiful game and I really do want to thank the devs for creating it. It was, it was fantastic and I had a lot of fun. So I'm just gonna let the uh, I'm gonna let 
the credits finish rolling here and uh, yeah thank you all for joining us and until next time Laters. Wednesday, the 4th of July, 1914, we have a final piece. Three weeks later, as all the world knows, we went to war. I joined the new army the first week, and owing to my Matter Bailey experience, got a captain's commission straight off. But I had done my best service, I think, before I put on khaki. Congratulations, you've completed the 39 steps. We hope you enjoyed playing this story as much as we did making it. Hopefully see you for our next digital adaptation. You will. And thanks again for joining us, everyone. And actually, this time for certain. Laters. Laters.